as difficult and as annoying as these instances of partial, subjective or just inaccurate reporting are, there are other factors um, beyond cynicism though, that exacerbate the problem. Journalists don't operate in a vacuum. If a newspaper has a particular editorial slant, politically or otherwise, it will be reflected in the type of stories that editors and their underlings are interested in. There can be pressure for journalists to come up with the goods that can be hard for reporters to stave off. And increasingly, and I think this is important, this is happening in the context of, of newsrooms being chronically understaffed. Local and regional news have been particularly badly hit over the last couple of years and in the last 12 months particularly. Budget cuts, staffing calls, <coughs> over 100 titles have closed altogether, leaving some towns without a local newspaper at all. And as a result, local and national democracy suffers. 64% um, of editors now believe that they're not adequately scrutinising local councils. 80% of judges believe that courts are not subject to adequate scrutiny. And these were once bread and butter basic functions of local news reporting. And there isn't always the time to properly research a story to do the most basic of checks. And if media analysts are to be believed, this situation can get a whole lot worse. So over the next three years, there are predictions that more than half of the country's 1,300 local newspapers will close, um, destroying another um, 20,000 media jobs as a result of that. And it's in that context that specialist reporters are becoming something of a dying breed. And industrial correspondents have all but died out. I think Alan Jones at the Press Association is one of the last men standing. And if you compare that to the 70s when media organisations had whole teams of specialists covering the trade unions, all with bulging contacts books and a genuine understanding of how trade unions operated, you can see the difference between then and where we are today. And this lack of knowledge and of experience has made the coverage we see on unions, I think, more polarised take the issue of ballots, which has been a big topic in recent months, the legality or otherwise of them, there is a real lack of knowledge amongst journalists about the limitations and the restrictions of the law that we're forced to operate in. The fact that the odds are weighted so heavily against ordinary people simply trying to exercise their democratic and their human right to withdraw their labour. And if, the company, if a company has the money and is minded to go to court, challenging a ballot is frankly a walk in the park. Um, and we're not all super unions. For a union the size of the NUJ, risking the legal fees and the costs to defend repeated challenges is not always the best uh, the most appropriate option. Yet journalists don't always see this, and I think the prevalent view remains that somehow a union and its members are taking illegal action when in fact it might come down to a very minor mistake about who was balloted, which in the face of an overwhelming decision to go on strike is irrelevant. So when the Unite Ballot BA was overturned in the courts on a technicality that centred on just 11 ballot papers and when a similar fate befell the RMT in its dispute with Network Rail, transport journalists in the main covered the stories and focused on the implications for travel chaos, not the rise in vexatious legal action by employers. And this kind of media coverage, prompted I think more by lack of exposure and experience than necessarily cynicism, is dangerous because it prepares the ground for the kind of action we know the Tories would love to take. To make it harder again for workers to get a successful ballot for industrial action, to stack the odds further again in the employer's favour. And in this context of cuts and the inevitable um, impact on quality journalism, the lack of specialists covering unions means that, as the effects of the toughest public spending cuts since the 30s kick in, media outlets haven't got the contacts and the links with the trade union movement and its seven million members that they should. And as a movement, we somehow lost the argument against the alternatives, which has meant that the prevailing public view is that cuts are somehow inevitable, and in the process, process we've also managed to see private sector workers pitted against their public sector counterparts. And I think we also need to look to ourselves as a movement rather than simply criticise the media which after all isn't some homogenous lump. It's made of a huge range of players, covers all kinds of journalists and media outlets of all manner of political persuasions. I think we need to be punching above our weight when it comes to garnering positive publicity and I think, I think some of the um, results of the um, survey bear that out too. And if you take the annual showcase of the movement, TUC Congress, that rare occasion when the media 
comes out and forced to cover a union-wide event. There's the inevitable coverage with its slightly mocking tones of the gathering of the brothers, that whole macho beer and sandwiches stereotype. But my heart sinks sometimes when I look around me when I'm at Congress and see that the gathered delegates are not always broadly representative of the cross-section of ages, of gender, of race that our movement <coughs> represents. It sinks even more when there's little real debate or when the only motion that the TUC General Council see fit to oppose is one on equality or as happened two or three years ago, one from the TUC's own women's conference on the provision of childcare at TUC events. Because for me, that's not what our movement is genuinely about. And if you go to other meetings, you go to other union gatherings and events, and it's clear that our movement is diverse, it is vibrant. And there are men and women in their thousands involved in excellent activism for their unions on a daily basis. Then there are the easy traps that I think unions fall into. Journalists can hardly be blamed for some of the stories that probably do most to contribute to some of the negative coverage we see about individual unions or leaders of unions in the press. I mean, realistically, if you're the leader of a trade union who chooses to stay in a suite in the Hilton, if you have your mortgage paid for you, you might have another grace and favour pad, or if you travel first class when you do business abroad, have a chauffeur who ferries you from meetings to meetings, as well as pocketing a six-figure salary, well, obviously, you're going to be the subject of a story at some point when it's, when it's timely for a newspaper group that questions whether really you're all about the workers or not. I, I think that's half the cause, frankly. And as trade unionists, we use the same techniques to ram it home when a boss is living the high life on the back of his employees, yet won't deliver the goods when it comes to the annual pay claim. So you can hardly be pious when it's used at us. And I don't think these stories or these facts do much to positively sell the benefits of trade union membership to the wider public. But at the end of the day, union leaders are responsible to their members. The NUJ, I think, is a particular type of union. I come from its perspective and traditions of um, relative openness and accountability. But the different unions have their own cultures and traditions, and that's fine. But that's not the media being cynical or journalists being cynical. These stories, I think, are there for the taking. And it's the job of journalists to raise uncomfortable truths. And some, sometimes, obviously, that backdrop to that is a political line a particular newspaper or proprietor or editor is taken. But if the facts are true, we can't fault journalists for bringing them to the public's attention. And finally, I think that some trade unions are better at others than at, at generating their own good news stories. They realise the benefits of professional journalists and press officers cultivating relationships and contacts with journalists, steering stories their way. I think, you know, there's many examples of this, but I think of, say, PCS, for example, um, despite the pressure they come under and the usual kind of militant hardline tags that they sometimes come up against, they do, I think, a consistently good job at getting their message out in difficult <coughs> circumstances, focusing on the key facts that give lie to the kind of public sector gold-plated pensions fallacy. And I think more of that approach is, is what's needed. Um, and in my experience at working at the Sunday Express, where, yes, the editor might have a punch on for Princess Diana conspiracy theories or more asylum seeker bashing, but if there was a genuinely good story that also happened to put a trade union in a positive light, it certainly wouldn't have been disregarded not disregarded out of hand. That's the way, I think, to combat the, prevail combat the prevailing mood within the media about the trade union movement, whether that's motivated by cynicism, political opportunism, or sheer ignorance. And thankfully, I think, a positive thing, that's something that trade unions can do something very pro proactively to combat. Michelle, thank you.